the, it, human beings take a long time to develop. You ask yourself, what's developing? Why all that time to develop? What is it that develops? You know, you could say, well, you know, a kitten, a kitten in what, you know, five months generally develops almost all of its faculties. Sight, hearing, and by soon after that they're ready to catch mice or whatever the hell they do, you know. Human beings, they don't do that. 18 years in, in a lot of cases, 15 years, you know, that kind of thing. You don't get, your, 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 your mental faculties are developing, if not for your whole life, which is what it should be, I suppose, but a lot of it is developing in, in various serious ways until you're about 18 or 20 years old. Why all that development? Why that much difference? Because human beings operate completely differently. We operate on the basis of knowledge, of ideas, of the ability to generate ideas, more importantly. So what we're faced with at this point, you can say, is the principles of the ideas that have been dominating society for the last 40 years, that have a history that go back hundreds of years, have brought the human species to an end of the way in which we can live under, those, under that system. Right now, it's either this monetary system or the human species. They both can't survive. Not the human species in any way, shape, or form as we know it. And you see it. If you let yourself see it, you see it. Look at Africa. Look at what's going on in China as the approach that they took to the last 20 years cannot work any longer. The, the, what they thought they could use to develop won't work. They predicated themselves on the idea that they would build up reserves based on cheap labor, effectively looting their own population, and then be able to use those reserves to invest in the capital development of China. The problem they face is the collapse of their export markets, and the fact is the reserves that they built up don't buy the capital that they need. Not only is the dollar shrinking in value, it just ain't there. We don't produce enough of it. Those are the realities that we face. Now, under those conditions, what really is leadership? Well, I'm going to give you a, a, a one idea of a concept of where to look for leadership. And for some of you, it, it comes from maybe a somewhat funny place. Because in many ways, a definition of where leadership comes from and the form that it's going to take or that it has to take is best described by Percy Shelley. Or at least that's a good description of it. Uh, LaRouche has made this point recently on a number of occasions. And I think there are many ways to approach this, but this is one interesting way to approach it. And I'm just going to read you a little, couple little sections from the beginning and the end. And then I'll give you one other idea of uh, an essay by uh, Shelley called uh, A Defense of Poetry. Oops. Now, I'll give you a little in the beginning because I think it's interesting to see what he's saying that poetry is. And for some of you who have been working on the Kepler, you might find surprising resonance in this, those of you who haven't looked at it. According to one mode of regarding those two classes of mental action, which are called reason and imagination, the former may be considered as mind contemplating the relations borne by one thought to another, however produced and the latter as mind acting upon those thoughts so as to color them with its own light and composing from them as from elements other thoughts each containing within itself the principle of its own integrity the one is the principle of synthesis and has for its objects those forms which are common to universal nature and existence itself the other is the principle of analysis and its action regards the relations of things simply as relations, considering thoughts not in their integral unity, 
but as the algebraical representations which conduct to certain general results. Reason is the enumeration of quantities already known. Imagination is the perception of the value of those quantities, both separately and as a whole. Reason respects differences, and imagination the similitudes of things. Reason is to the imagination as the instrument to the agent, as the body to the spirit, as the shadow to the substance. Poetry, in a general sense, may, de be, defined, may be defined to be the expression of the imagination. And poetry is conate with the origin of man. Man is an instrument over which a series of external and internal impressions are driven, like the alternations of, the ever, of an ever-changing wind over an aeolian lyre, which move it by their motion to ever-changing melody. But there is a principle within the human being, and perhaps within all sentient beings, which acts otherwise than in the lyre, and produces not melody alone, but harmony, by an internal adjustment of the sounds or motions thus excited to the impressions which excite them. It is as if the lyre could accommodate its chords to the motions of that which strikes them in a determined proportion of sound, even as the musician can accommodate his voice to the sound of the lyre. So I think very interesting in light of the book four of, of the harmonies of the world. Almost a condensed representation of a great deal of what Kepler says there. So what, what Shelley's getting at is that there is a power in the world, a principle, which is coherent with something about the human mind, human imagination, which he sees as the mind illuminating the sense and reasoning aspects. And there is an, there's a harmony, an attunement between the way that mind works and the way in which the principles manifest themselves in the universe. And of course, this can include human relations, which impinge upon the human individual. Now, there's a great deal in between, but just to go to the famous ending, which I'm going to read you a little bit more than is usually going over. The first part of these remarks, and these are the concluding remarks, has related to poetry in its elements and principles. And it has been shown, as well as the narrow limits assigned them would permit, that what is called poetry, in a restricted sense, has a common source with all other forms of order and beauty, according to which the materials of human life are susceptible of being arranged, and which is poetry in a universal sense. So. Poetry is really coherent, cognate with the order and the principles of the universe as a whole. Or the, uh, you know. the second part will have for its object an application of these principles to the present state of the cultivation of poetry and a defense of the attempt to idealize the modern forms of manners and opinions and compel them into a subordination to the imaginative and creative faculty. For the literature of England an energetic development of which has ever preceded or accompanied a great and free development of the national will has arisen, as it were, from a new birth. In spite of the low thought and envy which would undervalue contemporary merit, our own will be a memorable age in intellectual achievements, and we live among such philosophers and poets as surpass beyond comparison any who have appeared since the last national struggle for civil and religious liberty. So, he clearly, to him, the struggles for civil and religious liberty are what are coherent, or at least parallel, upsurges in poetic and creative activity. The most unfailing herald, companion, and follower of the awakening of a great people to work a beneficial change in opinion or institution is poetry. At such periods, there is an accumulation of the power of communicating and receiving intense and impassioned conceptions respecting man and nature. The persons in whom this power resides may often, as far as regards many portions of their nature, have little apparent correspondence with that spirit of good of which they are the ministers. But even whilst they deny and abjure, they are yet compelled to serve the power which is seated on the throne of their own soul. It is impossible to read the compositions 
of the most celebrated writers of the present day without being startled with the electric life which burns within their words. They measure the circumference and sound the depths of human nature with a comprehensive and all-penetrating spirit, and they are themselves the most sincerely astonished at its manifestations, for it is less their spirit than the spirit of the age. Poets are the hierophants of an unapprehended inspiration, the mirrors of the gigantic shadows which futurity casts upon the present, the words which express what they understand not, the trumpets which, which sing to battle and feel not what they inspire, the influence which is not moved but moves. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Now, by the way, that little thing, for those of you who haven't had a chance, I'll give you a, to read the paper that Lynn wrote. This thing, the mirrors of the gigantic shadows which futurity casts upon the present. This is what Lynn's talking about. How many of you have had a chance to look at the paper? Whoa. Okay. Anyway, you, you, you'll get to it. I thought maybe more people looked at it. Okay. So, Poets are the unacknowledged legislators. At, at certain points, the poet, who has in other sections that he goes through, in effect recreates the language to express new ideas. In a Riemannian sense, moves to a higher order of potential surface, of transcendental existence, creates new individualities. It's, it's the power of those ideas that move people to do things they otherwise wouldn't be thought to do. And in fact, they may surprise themselves that they're doing it. That is a real power in the world. It's not a disembodied power. It's not a mystical thing. It's the conditions of human life in the world we live in. It's the problems posed to us for which we are uniquely created. Because we exist precisely by a creative development of our knowledge of the universe and the solution of the problems that we face in the universe as we reach the conditions, the boundaries of our, of our existence. That's wealth. That's human society. And therefore, the discovery of these new principles, the discovery of these new, uh, new ideas, the creative innovations, allow us to expand beyond the present limits. By knowledge, not by... And, the, and it's that battle, it's those ideas as they are communicated. Because the, 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 the question here is, how do you get other human beings to act on these ideas? It's not good enough to just discover it yourself. All ide new ideas occur in a single individual. But they, to be efficient, they have to be communicated to other human beings. And in effect, poetry is the medium of communication of those kinds of ideas. Now, I'll give you an example just... A quick example of what um, the way Shelley sometimes expresses. I'm not going to, wouldn't bore you with the recitation of the whole thing, but because it's it, it's just in a couple of cases it's just there. Um, uh, should have done this. Here we go. Actually, okay. This one, I, I, I'll just reference this, but then I'll give you something a little bit different. This is from Hindu Intellectual Beauty. The awful shadow of some unseen power floats, though unseen, among us. Visiting this various world with as inconstant wing as summer winds that creep from flower to flower. Like moonbeams that behind some piney mountain shower 
It visits with inconstant glance each human heart and countenance. Like hues and harmonies of evening, like clouds in a starlight widely spread, like memory of music fled, like aught that for its grace may be dear and yet dearer for its mystery. And then he goes on in this vein. You have to read the whole thing. But to get an idea, the awful shadow of some unseen power. Now, probably one of the great examples of this, which is much longer, is Mont Blanc, which is virtually a kind of a hymn to this concept of the physical universe and the relationship to the cognitive in the human individual. And more, I don't want to banalize it, but you, you get an idea. The everlasting universe of things flows through the mind and rolls its rapid waves, now dark, now glittering, now reflecting gloom, now lending splendor where from secret springs the source of human thoughts its tribute brings of waters with a sound but half its own, such as a feeble brook will oft assume in the wild woods among the mountains lone, where waterfalls around it leap forever, where woods and winds contend and a vast river over its rocks ceaselessly bursts and raves. Thus thou, ravine of Arve, dark, deep ravine, thou many-colored, many-voiced veil, over whose pines and crags and caverns sail fast cloud shadows and sunbeams, awful scene, where powers and likeness of the Arve come down from the ice gulfs that gird his secret throne, bursting through these dark mountains like the flame of lightning through the tempest, and so on. You get an idea. I, the, the ending maybe gives you the better idea. Mont Blanc yet gleams on high. The power is there. The still and solemn power of many sights and many sounds and much of life and death. In the calm darkness of the moonless nights, in the lone glare of day, the snows descend upon that mountain. None beholds them there, nor when the flakes burn in the sinking sun or the starbeams dart through them. Winds contend silently there and heap the snow with breath, with breath rapid and strong, but silently. It's, it's home thy voiceless lightning in these solitudes keep innocently and like vapor broods over the snow. The secret strength of things which governs thought and to the infinite dome of heaven is as a law inhabits thee. And what were thou and earth and stars and sea if to the human mind's imaginings silence and solitude were vacancy? So, you know, there's something that Shelley has a handle on. That's not easy. That is profound about the human mind. And so you have to look at these. This is a question of leadership. To see, my point is, this is political leadership. This is the issue of political leadership. Now, the example that, you know... Um, You know, if you if some of you should look at if you look at Lynn's writings from this standpoint, or even some of the webcasts, or the, the you get a different quality in the, in things like the Q and A and the dialogue, but particularly in the Q and A. A lot of times, when you say to yourself, "He's not answering the question," think about it. He may be answering the question. He may be answering the real question that's being asked, not the simple string of words that you heard. Now, if you look at the history of the United States, and the United States is a has a unique history. I, I think probably maybe Mark mentioned, I mean, the, uh, you know, in, in this question of the four powers, Russia, China, India, the United States, and I won't go into it, but the, 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 the unique role of the United States is the Constitution of the United States, the preamble of the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States, it's not so much the words. It was written by people who were committed to expressing in a constitutional form 
the fundamental universal principles of human development. That's what the general welfare principle is. In order to form a more perfect union, you know, as I said, think about it, a more perfect union. Now, there's a case, you know, everything is expressed by irony, everything, because the world is, const is a constant process of change, of facing problems and re uh, reorganizing our ideas. So how could something be a more perfect union? Perfect doesn't allow for more. <laughs> At least in the English language, the definition of perfection is it's perfect. You, it's finished. You can't do anything better. That's what perfect means. Okay? So how can you have a more perfect union? So, you know, it's an irony. I, in a sense... That we're redefining the idea that we're not looking for a perfect union. We're looking for a union that's capable of constantly perfecting itself. Which is a, a coherent with a species that is not fixed in its development. And then, you know, in order to secure ourselves, to secure our posterity, to secure the future. So the, 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 the purpose of the Constitution is not to address the issues of the population that exists today. The purpose of the Constitution is to exist the immortal souls of the people who live today. Because what the, the idea is that the nation exists to carry your actions as a mission to leave, to create the ability of future generations to act. And the, the, the nation is to protect your legacy, is to make your legacy live into the future, is to give you the chance to be human. To take the ideas and allow them to be expressed to, uh, for the, for the, for future generations. That's why the United that's that's why the United States is significant, is one of the four powers. That's its heritage. And indeed, this is reflected in the seemingly mundane aspect that we are a credit system with a, a sovereign currency. That is, we control the currency of the nation, at least constitutionally. That's not the case now. And what is it? We control the issuance of credit, i.e. the development of the, the nation for the future, and we allow money to be uttered only on the basis of the credit that's allowed for future development. And that's a constitutional principle. That's how we run. That's how we're set up. That's how we're supposed to operate. That's not true for almost any other country in the world. Virtually every other country, certainly European countries, operate based on a central banking system that allows the monetization of any form of debt that's issued by the banking system. And in fact, that's in part what you see in this whole insane bailout. They're arguing that anything that we issued that has a money value has to be monetized in some form or other. You don't have the right to say, no, we're going to distinguish between good and bad debt. Now, ironically enough, what, you, what we've been fortunate enough up to this point and what we see the opportunity of now, because what this represents is indeed the crisis is striking the existing institutions, the existing people. People have decided that they're going to, that they're going to move on this administration because the country... The future is at stake. And if you're, in, if you're in any shape a patriot, you have to act now to save the country. You can't just look at your political... See, and, and frankly, there's too much cynicism in the population. The fact of the matter is, Hillary Clinton took the Secretary of State because she wants to do something about the country. Otherwise, she would have avoided it. Bill Clinton agreed to have all of his speeches vetted by the administration because the country's at stake. 
Bob Gates stayed in as Secretary of Defense because the country is at stake. Now, a lot of people in the street will say, well, they just did it, you know, they just went to fame and fortune, whatever the hell. That maybe they got bribed, I don't know. It's not true. There's no bribe that would make you stay in an administration that you didn't like, that hated you, and that you thought was going to be destroyed. What bribe would get you to stay for that? <laughs> Sometimes the cynicism is absurd. It's just a way to protect people, protect themselves. You say, well, everybody's a cheat, everybody's this and that, therefore I, don't have, <laughs> therefore I don't have to do anything. I just wish somebody would bribe me. <laughs> what, what, I, what I'm really angry at is no one has bribed me. You know, if, if, people, if some of these guys be honest, that's what they would say, you know. All these guys, they take bribes and they got money, that, that's all they're in it for. You know, somebody like that, you say, well, wait a minute. Suppose I offered you $20,000, what would you do? <laughs> Suppose I told you I have it right now. <laughs> a lot of these people, you, you watch, watch them if you said something like that. <laughs> it wouldn't even have to be that much money. You know, $20,000 these days ain't much. Okay. Now, what's happened, in the, in, in, at least in the two great crises that the United States faced, is we have been fortunate enough to find a certain quality of leadership. Now, you know, we have the example of Roosevelt. And in some ways, to my mind, a person who comes closer to this idea of the poet as legislator or the unacknowledged legislator is Lincoln. Now, there happens to be a big deal now about Lincoln also, and some of it, I think, you know, uh, it's his 200th birthday coming up. 2009, and uh, there's, a, there's a, a jumble of books out and so on and so forth. And there have been a couple of these books which try to argue that indeed he is the greatest literary figure in U.S. history. Now, you know, I, I, my, I think it's true. The problem is the way these guys argue for it is usually wrong. They miss the point. Now, another way it misses the point is that Obama is supposedly a great fan of Abe Lincoln. And all I can say, that may be true. I'm not saying he's not a fan of Abe Lincoln. But there's no sign that he understands what Lincoln did. Lincoln, for example, throughout his entire life, supported the Whig policy of a national bank, internal improvements, which meant infrastructure, rail, et cetera, et cetera, and protectionism. He was, in that sense, a Whig. That was the that was the that was the, the the policy of the Whig Party of Henry Clay and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter was that Lincoln was a kind of genius, or let's say he was a genius. You know, Schiller, Schiller says that the, that the greatest form of art is statecraft. The greatest art is freedom, liberty. Shelley effectively says poets are the unacknowledged legislators. Lincoln understood, as no one else in his generation did, even though he was created by many, you know, he, he had the virtue of being a protege of John Quincy Adams. And undoubtedly, in some things that we, uh, you know, some of the Whigs of the area, Clay was his early hero, and so on and so forth. He was a student of the Constitution. He was a student of George Washington. And interestingly enough, we do know, and some things we may not know all, everything we'd like to know, he was also a student probably preeminently of William Shakespeare. I mean, keep in mind, and this is you have to sort of think this because it's mentioned, but it, it misses a, a whole lot. Shakespeare, uh, Lincoln read Shakespeare to his cabinet. I don't know of any other example like that. Could you imagine W reading Shakespeare to his cabinet? Huh? Condi Rice. To be or not to be? What do y'all think? Huh? Yeah, right. I don't know if he can get that much out. 
I, I, I love to see George W. say, whether it is nobler in the mind. Okay. It's unimaginable. But this is the case. I mean, you know, over and over and over again. It wasn't one time. It, it, for example, in the last trip he took to meet with a certain number of some of these Confederates who were trying to negotiate with him in 64, 65, he had a bunch of the cabinet and he read Macbeth to them, sections of Macbeth. He read it. These were things that he used. He saw uh, Othello as very much a way of getting at the question of race in the United States. He saw Macbeth as a way of understanding the way in which power drove people crazy or the ambition. But even more, he saw it fundamentally as getting across fundamental aspects of statecraft. He, uh, you know, by, he probably saw during the, whatever it was, um, thousand or so, well, a little more, I guess, uh, 1,400 days or so he was the president of the United States, he apparently saw at least 100 plays, many of them Shakespeare plays. He was a personal friend of, you know, one of the great ironies. He was a, a friend of Edwin Booth, who was John Wilkes Booth's brother, who was considered the greatest uh, American Shakespearean actor. But it, he was also a, a proponent of uh, Thomas Gray, who was a British poet, I don't know that well, Robert Burns. He's reputed to have carried Edgar Allan Poe with him all the time. And uh, it's my belief that he certainly knew uh, a great deal of Keats and Shelley. This is, he studied this over and over and over again. And his whole idea was, how do you get across the fundamental principles of statecraft at a time when the entire state was at stake? This was a time of civil war, where some of the, the idea was, could a, a state break from the Union? What were the constitutional principles? How did he have to operate? And how did he have to communicate that to the rest of the nation? And to organize the nation. It, it, you know, one of the things that struck people, and, you know, there, uh, when people, uh, there was a period recently where there was a great deal of popularity for letters from Union soldiers to their wives and girlfriends and mothers and etc. And people were struck by the level of literacy, by the quality of writing in many cases. Because this was a time when these guys were infused with some fairly profound ideas that they were fighting for and learned to fight for in the course of the war. A perfect example of what Shelley's talking about. Lincoln organized them. Lincoln fought with them. He developed um, with others the fundamental profound ideas that were being fought out in the, in the Civil War. And many of the, peop of the people of the Union found themselves expressing ideas that otherwise they would not be near. Overcoming prejudice. And he fought. That's why it took him so long. People say, why didn't he do the Emancipation Proclamation right away? Why didn't he just let the slaves go? Well, in part, he was committed to the Union. He knew the Union had to be saved above all else. And he says this. But he also knew that people had to learn that indeed the Negroes should be freed, that they were equal that the Constitution did protect them. And in part, they found it out in the crucible of war. Because the key thing that occurred, that allowed the emancipation to occur, and that it followed it through, was that freed slaves joined the Union Army and fought. Just as in World War II, the Civil Rights Movement was built to a large extent, on the generation that fought in World War II and recognized that, indeed, African Americans had fought as they had and that we had fought against fascism, which had slaughtered millions. And how could you come back, even with your prejudices, and say that these people shouldn't vote, shouldn't be allowed to sit at a lunch counter?
And so that process took place in the Civil War. And Lincoln led it. Now, let me tell you, this idea, like give you one idea that is just wrong. And I, 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 it's wrong conceptually. It's wrong. You know it's wrong because the principle of it is wrong. The idea that is now a popular idea, everybody talks about it. And, you know, supposedly this has an effect on the new administration. That, well, you know, it's from this book. You know, I, I don't know the quality of the woman. I read the book. Um, uh, Team of Rivals by Dor Doris Kearns Goodwin. Okay. Um, what's the argument? Well, it, he was a brilliant, practical politician because he knew what he should do is take in all these big egos that had run against them in the presidential campaign, you know, Bates, uh, Seward, uh, Chase, and I think Gideon Wells, right? Am I got it right? Something like that. Okay. And the idea was that, uh, or Blair, I forget which one, uh, that he was going to bring them all in and control them that way. And that that was a practical ploy that he used. That, that's not what happened. Now, the, the only bit of truth in it is that Lincoln wanted a cabinet that represented what in the Union had to be held together. The border states, the abolitionists, the Democrats who were willing to go along with them, some of the Whigs who were bad on the, on the slavery question. I mean, Bates was borderline. Chase was an ambitious abolitionist, supposedly. But the problem was, this is what the Union was. Now, his, what was Lincoln's idea? Lincoln's idea was to educate this group of people to the concept of the Union that he represented. And that's what he did. And one, one of the great virtues was most of these guys, whatever their problem was, and Chase had big problems with them, but Seward, Bates, they recognized that indeed, you know, in the beginning, all these guys thought that you had this country bumpkin, this guy who was uneducated, knew no foreign languages, had never been anywhere, crudely dressed, that, that, okay, this guy happened to win, but they were going to be the ones who ran it. I mean, Seward definitely thought that. I'm sure Chase did, okay? And what happened was, by the time, as they went through the Civil War, they realized that he, in fact, was the one who understood what was going on. That he was the preeminent figure in the United States. The same thing happened on the military question. I mean, Lincoln was not a military great strategist genius. But one of the virtues of uh, Grant and uh, Sherman was that they did not have an ego problem with Lincoln. Not like McClellan, not like some of these other guys, even some of the lesser figures. Well, who is this guy to tell me what to do? He's not a military figure. Grant and Sherman realized that in terms of concept of what the war was about, which is the issue of how you win a war, in terms of concept of what peace would have to be after the war, the Reconstruction, as Lincoln understood it, and expressed it in his last speech. That he was the preeminent thinker in terms of strategy for the Union. And they subordinated themselves to what Lincoln wanted done. And in some sense, that was the best thing that they did. And they were committed to the Union itself. Now, if you want to get uh, some idea, and maybe the best thing is, instead of dragging out, if you want to get some idea of the way Lincoln thought, I'll just read you a couple things. Because, you know, Lincoln, you know, both educated and elevated the population. And you get some flavor of this. I mean, it's a broader argument to say that, um, I'll give you one sense. This will, be a, this will probably seem a little bit like a legalistic argument, but nonetheless. 
there's more. To, it's much more profound than a legal argument. Oh God, I don't have it. Yeah. Let me see. Let me see if it's in here. Yeah. I think I, it's in the other book. Volume five, it's in it's in there. Huh, that was funny, I thought I had it. Is it there? Yeah. Thanks. This is you know, um, he writes a letter to Greeley, who was a famous newspaper guy of the day. And Greeley has complained to him that he's not doing enough to free the slaves and blah, blah, blah. So he says, and these, by the way, one thing you should know, these letters were not just, these circulated in hundreds of thousands. They were printed up, they were circulated, you know, intentionally. Oh, in so, newspapers or how, how did they circulate? They sent them out in flyers, newspapers, yeah, pamphlets. Okay. I have, he responds really, I have just read yours of the 19th, addressed to myself through the New York Tribune. If there be in it any statements or assumptions of fact, which I may know to be erroneous, I do not now and here controvert them. If there be in it any inference which I may believe to be falsely drawn, I do not now and here argue against them. If there be perceptible in it an impatient and dictatorial tone, I waive it in deference to an old friend whose heart I have always supposed to be right. As to the policy I seem to be pursuing, as you say, I have not meant to leave anyone in doubt. I would save the Union. I would save it the shortest way under the Constitution. The sooner the national authority can be restored, the nearer the Union will be the Union as it was. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time save slavery, I do not agree with them. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do, believe, I do it because I believe it helps to save the Union. And what I forbear... I forbear because I do not believe it would help save the Union. I shall do less whenever I shall believe what I am doing hurts the cause. And I shall do more whenever I shall believe doing more will help the cause. I shall try to correct errors when shown to be errors, and I shall adopt new views so fast as they shall appear to be true views. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty, and I intend no modification of my oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. Now, first of all, think of something. Could you imagine that complicated an argument presented to the American public today? <laughs> right? So, and it's it, because, look, by the way, he's making the same argument. He makes the point later on that, in a sense, or he makes it early in the first inaugural, the, the states can't really leave the Union. They don't exist without the Union. There was never a state without the Union. There were colonies without the Union, but never a state without the Union. Now, this is the same point that Hamilton makes in the first Federalist letter. If you don't have a Union, you don't have a country, you don't have anything. And none of these states or colonies could have survived on their own. Therefore, ontologically, the Union comes first. Now, the Constitution recognizes the importance of states and local activity, but it leaves to the states what is not left to the Union. 
And so what Lincoln is getting at is without the Union, there will be slavery. Probably everywhere. And the only way to, to avert slavery is to protect the Union and stop the spread of slavery. And ultimately, of course, in the war, the slaves were freed as a consequence of the war. But this is, this is exactly the type of process of education. Now, a good, another good example of this is a letter that he writes. Again, he wrote this letter in response to um, a, a, a convention that was cur- occurring in Illinois, which basically, as you'll see, was upset about the fact that indeed um, blacks were now in the Union Army. So this was uh, the letter to um, Greeley was August of uh, 1863. Now, I'm not going to read the whole letter. The letter is a few pages. But um, what he says... um, I'll give you the beginning, and then I'll read you the relevant point, one relevant part. Your letter inviting me to attend a mass meeting of unconditional union men to be held at the capital of Illinois on the third day of September has been received. It would be very agreeable to me to, meet th- to thus meet my old friends at my own home, but I cannot just now be absent from here so long as a visit there would require. The meeting is to be of all those who maintain unconditional devotion to the union, And I am sure my old political friends will thank me for tendering, as I do, the nation's gratitude to those other noblemen whom no partisan malice or partisan hope can make false to the nation's life. There are those who are dissatisfied with me. To such I would say, you desire peace and you blame me that we do not have it. But how can we attain it? There are three three conceivable ways. First, to suppress the rebellion by force of arms. This I am trying to do. Are you for it? If you are, so far we are agreed. If you are not for it, a second way is to give up the Union. I'm against this. Are you for it? If you are, you should say so plainly. If you are not for force, nor yet for dissolution, there only remains some imaginable compromise. I do not believe any compromise embracing the maintenance of the Union is now possible. All I learn leads to a directly opposite belief. The strength of the rebellion is its military, its army. The army dominates all the country and all the people within its range, and so on and so forth. So then, but I hear, um, you dislike the Emancipation Proclamation and perhaps would have it retracted. You say it is unconstitutional. I think differently. I think the Constitution invests its commander-in-chief with the law of war in time of war. The most that can be said, if so much, is that slaves are property. Is there, has there ever been any question that by the law of war, property, both of enemies and friends, may be taken when needed? And is it not needed whenever taking it helps or hurts the enemy? Armies, the world over, destroy enemies' properties when they cannot use it, and even destroy their own to keep it from the enemy. Civilized belligerents do all in their power to help themselves or hurt the enemy, except a few things regarded as barbarous or cruel. Among the exceptions are massacres of vanquished foes and non-combatants. But the proclamation as law either is valid or is not valid. If it is not valid, it, if, it, if it is not valid, it needs no retraction. If it is valid, it cannot be retracted any more than the dead can be brought to life. Some of you profess to think its retraction would operate favorably for the Union, and so on and so forth. But then he gets to the, he says, "You say you will not fight for, to, for, for, to free Negroes." Some of them seem willing to fight for you, but no matter. Fight you, then, exclusively to save the Union. I issued the proclamation on purpose to aid you in saving the Union. Whenever you shall have conquered all resistance to the Union, if I shall urge you to continue fighting, it will be an apt time, then, for you to declare you will not fight to free Negroes. I thought that in your struggle for the Union, to whatever extent the Negroes should cease helping the enemy, to that extent it weakened the enemy." in his resistance to you. Do you think differently? I thought that whatever Negroes can be got to do as soldiers, 
leaves just so much less for white soldiers to do in saving the Union. Does it appear otherwise to you? But Negroes, like other people, act upon motives. Why should they do anything for us if we will do nothing for them? If they stake their lives for us, they must be prompted by the strongest motive, even the promise of freedom. And the promise being made must be kept. The signs look better. The father of the waters again goes unvexed to the sea, thanks to the great Northwest for it. And then he goes through this whole thing about how the nation was pulled together uh, from Gettysburg and so on and so forth. Peace does not appear so distant as it did. I hope it will come soon and come to stay, and so come as to be worth the keeping in all future time. It will then have been proved that, among free men, there can be no successful appeal from the ballot to the bullet, and that, those who t and that they who take such appeal are sure to lose their case and pay the cost. And then there will be some black men who can remember that, with silent tongue and clenched teeth, and steady eye, and well-poised bayonet, they have helped mankind onto this great consummation. While, I fear, there will be some white ones, unable to forget that, with malignant heart and deceitful spe speech, they have strove to hinder it. Still let us not be over-sanguine of a speedy final triumph. Let us be quite sober. Let us diligently apply the means, never doubting that a just God in his own good time will give us the rightful result. Yours very truly, Abe Lincoln. Never let it be said he kowtowed to anybody. That was his supporters he was talking to. So, yeah, you have to let... This is an education of a population. This is a kind of poetry. I'm not saying that was poetry in, 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 the, in the strict sense. But it's, it's, it's the poetry of communicating an idea. It's leading a nation. It's fighting for ideas that are necessary at a point of existential crisis. This is the same Lincoln who built the Transcontinental Railroad, who developed the entire industry of the North, admittedly in the middle of war. But that was his policy from before that. Now, what I want to do is I want to end. I was going to do something else, but I, I, I didn't do this well because, um, you know, I'm not the greatest. Um, is, there any, <laughs> is, is there anybody here who wants to recite the second inaugural, read the second inaugural? Okay. Want to take a crack at it? I'll do it. Okay, here. I'm also losing my voice. Well, I'm not. But I'm sure I'll find you. Here. This is, we can say, uh, we'll end with this. Because in many ways, I'll give it away, this is the most profound example. It's, it's his next to the last speech, effectively. Here. Fellow countrymen, at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first. Then a statement, somewhat in detail, of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper. Now, at the expiration of four years, during which public declarations have been constantly called forth on every point and phase of the great contest, which still absorbs the attention, and engrosses the energies of the nation, little that is new could be presented. The progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself, and it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all, with high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it, all sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war. 
seeking to dissolve the union and divide effects by negotiation. But parties, both parties rather, deprecated war. But one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive. And the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. One eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest, interest was, somehow, the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union, even by war. While the government claimed no right to do, to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it, neither party expected the war, the magnitude, or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of another man's face. But let us judge not that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to the man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came. Shall we discern therein any departure from the, those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's two hundred and fifty years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said three thousand years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work that we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow, and for his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. So, you can think that that's, that's, that's not an easy thing. And this is his second inaugural, that's to the nation. This is not triumphalism. This is not backing off. This is an idea of what happened. In some sense, he is saying the North and the South brought this on themselves. You can't walk away. And yet, indeed, the North was right. Now, of course, his great task, as he understood it, was to bring the nation back together. 
Now, this is what I think it, it means to say this is political leadership. This is the unacknowledged legislators. This is not a team of rivals. This is not some practical political game. That's the way you have to understand this. I, I was, there, there's more, because Lincoln actually says in other places, I'm not going to go through now, we, um, that his entire guiding post is the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. That was the principle, the principle of the Union. He operated by universal principles that he saw embedded in the mission of the United States as a nation, and to which he organized the entire population. Maybe one example of this is a good one. I think this might have been, no, this is earlier. This is from 1858, so you see the consistency. They cannot carry themselves back into that glorious epoch and make themselves feel they are a part of us but when they look through that old Declaration of Independence, they find that those old men say that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And then they feel that the moral sentiment taught in that day evidences their relation to those men, that it is the father of all moral principle in them, and that they have a right to claim it as though they were blood of the blood and flesh of the flesh of the men who wrote that declaration, and so they are. That is the electric cord in that declaration that links the hearts of patriotic and liberty-loving men together that will link those patriotic hearts as long as the love of freedom exists in the minds of men throughout the world. And he was referring uh, basically to immigrants who have no direct connection to the Founding Fathers by, by, you know, by, inherit by blood. And you can go on. There's many, many other cases of this. I think if you, if you look at these kinds of things, you really do get a sense of what Shelley's talking about. Okay? So, I think I'll end it there. Yeah. Um, how do you, uh, in terms of our, our constitutional system, presidents like Lincoln, but also all presidents, who, as they're writing these letters and everything they do, you know, is recorded. Like, you know, we have Lincoln's collected works, we have Eisenhower's collected works. All, every president has these volumes. And, uh, I mean, that seems to be part of the presidency, is the thoughts of these guys, the way they shape policy. I mean, what I'm wondering about from your class, um, like, how, how do you think real law, because you taught on how, like, positive law works, <coughs> how, or how it doesn't work. But how does like a, a true natural law get shaped by these types of institutions in as a developing process? Well, I, I think you, you got to start a, a little bit. And including actual, I mean, not just natural law in the most abstract yeah. sense, but even in terms of concrete law that actually serves the good. Well, the way I would look at it, I mean, this is a, it's a, probably a tough qu you know, question. I don't have it, but the way I would look at it is, is a little bit from the standpoint of the Constitution. In a sense, the Constitution sets up the institutions that we're talking about. It gives the powers and so on and so forth. Now, it then becomes the, 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 uh, the arena of the living people operating under, under the Constitution and then the development from the Constitution to apply and make, the, and, and make ex explicit the application of the principles of the Constitution to the circumstances in which they operate. So, for example, one ex good example of this is that, for obvious reasons, Lincoln, in uh, the first inaugural, for example, talks about the preamble of the Constitution. Okay, But his essential point is the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. Be and, and for, it's clear that this is what he has to highlight. In his mind, this principle is going to be the guiding principle of the Constitution, uh, the, the rock upon which he bases himself, even though his, his overall development as a, it, in terms of uh, internal improvements and so forth was more broadly based as a Whig principle in the preamble. Okay? Now, if you look at Roosevelt, 
Roosevelt, based, not that he doesn't reference all men are created equal, but the, the, the point that Roosevelt develops over and over again is the preamble. Remember, uh, in, the, in the first few pages of um, his public papers, in the introduction, maybe it's the second volume. Anyway, yeah, it's the second volume. Uh, he says, the New Deal is the preamble of the Constitution. The entire basis of the New Deal is the preamble of the Constitution. It's based on the concept of the general welfare. Okay? So I think in many ways that's where you have to look at it. The Constitution is a written expression of natural law. Natural law can never be written down, but you try in a Constitution to establish a certain set of guidelines which allow you to constantly refer back to the natural law. Okay? So then, then what you get from the institutional of the presidency, and look, in this case, you have, you have the rare cases where you have a president who embodies the institution. Now, that's only happened a few times in the history of the United States. Maybe some people, you know, you can, you can pick out maybe a half a dozen presidents who lived up to the office. And in other cases, we had something no good and we had nothing to deal with it. But what you did have was always the ability to bring that power back into existence, to fight through the institutions to contain a bad president uh, or t and to reflect other policies. And this did happen during the course of the latter part of the 19th century when there were big fights over, you know, infrastructure development and even things like what happened after the Civil War. Okay. Reconstruction and so on and so forth. I mean, Grant was a very ambiguous figure. I mean, he was, he actually, I think, was, was oriented in the right way. His problems were largely economic and financial. He really didn't get the problem with Wall Street. I don't think he was corrupt. I think he didn't get it. That there's two different things. He's accused of being corrupt because his son-in-law was a Wall Street speculator, blah, blah, blah. I don't know all the details on that. But I think if you look at Grant, if you read the memoirs, if you see what he did, that he just didn't understand the problem. Lincoln did. Remember, Lincoln's first major political speech was on the sub-treasury. It was on the National Bank in uh, 1939 or something. December, it was December 26, 1939 or something like that. Huh? 1839, excuse me. Right? And it's all on the sub-treasury versus the National Bank. And he saw the sub-treasury as basically <coughs> functioning to open up areas of financial speculation and corruption. So I think that's the way it would have to work. Um, it's clear that Frederick Douglass was um, a part of Abraham Lincoln's um, presidential cabinet as far as I'm curious, though. Um, I want to know what you think about the importance of um, Frederick Douglass uh, and his role and the role that he played in influencing Lincoln. Well, I, I, I think he did. I mean, they didn't know each other that well until the Civil War. In fact, they met in the middle of the Civil War. And, you know... Lincoln knew of him and greeted him, and, uh, you know, I think he knew something of the story of Frederick Douglass. Douglass, and, you know, uh, Douglass said that Lincoln treated him in a surprisingly open manner. And then, of course, D Douglass was very critical of Lincoln in points. Um, the main statement that, that Douglass made about Lincoln was, look, if you understand what his situation was from the standpoint of the slave, he was slow, tardy and recalcitrant. From the standpoint of the country he was leading, he was quick, you know, uh, reckless, and so on and so forth. Radical. So, and radical, right? So he, uh, Douglas understood this. Now, I think what is the case is from the point that Lincoln met Douglas, he took Douglas as a, as a leading advisor, particularly on the issue of uh, uh, blacks in the, in the military, you know, it was Douglas who pushed Lincoln very hard on that question. He also, in particular, pushed Lincoln on the treatment of blacks in the Union because for a long time in the Union Army, they were treated unequally, they were paid differently, 
and so on and so forth. It was Douglas who organized Lincoln to improve the circumstances. Now, at a certain point, Lincoln felt he couldn't go all the way. So he brought the standard of treatment of black soldiers closer to the standard in the army, and he fought for this. And he fought for this under D Douglas's uh, intervention, though he didn't go as far as Douglas wanted. And this was the typical kind of, I, don't, I wouldn't even say it was friction. I mean, Lincoln took Douglas's criticism seriously. He just felt that he couldn't do everything that Douglas wanted. You know, that, that, those are points you can look at. But there's no doubt from the point they met to the end of the war, in particular on this question of the importance of, it was, it, Douglas was the one who argued vociferously for the importance of bringing slave, you know, freed slaves and so forth into the army. So there was a, there was a degree of respect there that uh, went over to direct special advisory role that, you know, continued from the point that they met. So those are examples. That's the best I can say. I couldn't tell you more about how much Lincoln took Douglas in, but there's no doubt this was, a, a, you know, an important factor. And, of course, if you look at it, this whole issue of blacks in the Union Army was a critical question. In many ways, it was decisive. Some people think it was decisive in the war. Now, I'm, I'm not, I couldn't say for sure, but there are those who believe that that was the, the decisive factor in the war. Well, I think it would do worse than that, Frank. I mean, an assassination now, unless we're able to create the circumstances, and hopefully it's such that it won't happen, period. But unless we can have a, a, a significant impact on people understanding, not just, not just calming people down, people understanding what's going on, where this is coming from, in, on its own, this would just be chaos. It would be hell. It would be uh, uh, an unmitigated disaster. I don't think it would just mess up what's going on. I think what you might get if, if we're doing our job is actually the people who have moved on the presidency might make a serious effort to counterbalance the disastrous effects. Because they, they, they if they're operating at all from the standpoint of knowing what's at stake, and I think some of them are, then they would recognize this as simply an escalation of the existential attack on the on the nation. I mean, the big problem in all these things is never leave. You, you can't view this from a standpoint of what would happen if I wasn't involved in it. You, you got to look at it from the standpoint of okay, how do you act upon these situations? What do you do to forestall them or change their outcomes? What's that? On the job training. Yeah. Um, <laughs> huh? <laughs> what? He said you was going. Oh. Because <laughs> I said something he didn't understand. <laughs> so, uh, because it seems to me that that training is going to have to come from the people who Mm -hmm. a better insight into the, the gravity of the situation and the type of solution that's coming through. And I was wondering our role in particular in not training Obama as in personally one-on-one, -on -one, but the type of education of the population to be able to, mm -hmm. to assimilate. Uh, Look, I think you're going to see, I think you're going to see in Lynn's paper today when you get it, the kind of education that Lynn's talking about. Because, look, this is meant as an intervention. It's, you know, the lies about the Bretton Woods versus a, a, a truthful, I forget the title, but something, you know, physical science. That he's saying we have to get this idea of physical economy, physical science, the nature of the human mind has got to be something discussed and acted on in the population. You know, now, beyond that, look, I wouldn't even, I, you know, if, if we can get Obama some on-the-job training, 
I would get him Lynn. You can say, well, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat serious. I'm not saying from some, you know, let's go out and say Obama should get Lynn in. Not that. But what you want to have is with pe if, if there are people around who have a respect for Lynn and are in this administration, and I think they are, I'm not saying, you know, I think that's what Lynn thinks, okay, then you would want them to bring either Lynn directly or Lynn by name, at least. Say, look, Mr. Obama, you really should get this guy. And don't worry about the name. Don't be freaked out that George Soros doesn't like him. Don't be freaked out about John Train. Now, that's the, the kind of impact you would have to have. Now, the only way you're going to get that, I think, is if it's clear that in the population, these ideas are gaining greater and greater social force. But at that level, I think, Lynn, you'll, you'll see in the paper today, I'd rather not preempt it. I, I couldn't preempt it. All right. Anything else? Otherwise? Okay. All right.